Thank you all for coming to this event. I'm sure it was not an easy decision to actually uh, to come here. I mean, it's uh, likewise we, uh, I guess, I mean, it's uh, every, every day the, the news is different. So actually uh, we were wondering if we should actually go ahead with this event today. Um, but uh, I think, I mean, when, when we found out actually the university is recommending a lot of these things, then uh, it was a little bit too late because it was last night. Yesterday afternoon, and a lot of you were probably on your way here. Actually, how many of you actually flew in? Okay, yeah. So, I mean, you made an effort to actually come here, and then I thank you for that. Um, but having said that, we, uh, given the the time, I think we actually uh, decide to make some effort to actually uh, mitigate the some concerns about the 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 coronavirus and things like that. So, actually, that's the only thing that concerns me right now. <laughs> Um, um, so there are, are important things uh, other than grad school, although that's actually very important. Um, so the one thing that we did was actually for lunch, we used to actually have this uh, big buffet style lunch and then that makes a lot of people uneasy. I think that's when this was made the, the box lunch thing. So you can basically, if you want, you can just take the box and go somewhere in the corner and then just eat yourself. However, uh, I think it's probably a good idea to uh, talk to other people and, and to make, kind of make it a little bit easier, we are going to spread people over two rooms. So, so the box lunch will be picked up outside or on this side. And then uh, that lounge, that so-called undergraduate lounge for our department, and then uh, you can stay there. Or, um, okay, thank you. And, or we actually have booked our graduate lounge, which uh, is uh, a little bit bigger space, which actually you can go and then uh, uh, have there. So I will also advise the faculty and graduate students to sort of spread over these two spaces so that you can have more discussions. And I'll probably try to uh, steer certain groups of people into certain rooms so that actually you meet people who have sh who share who share actually common interests in terms of research-wise. Um, the big thing here is that, uh, okay, not big thing. It might actually not matter that much, but for dinner, uh, we have booked the uh, print-up pub, which is uh, actually not very far from here, uh, from uh, six to eight. But if you don't want to actually join a big group of people for having dinner, then it's completely fine for us if you want to go somewhere else uh, or go home or go with uh, a couple of your friends and things like that, but uh, we will actually reimburse for that dinner uh, if you don't want to join us. But it's Friday night, maybe it's difficult to find the space. Uh, it uh, depends. I mean, we have a, a big space pre reserved at print up pub, so if you do happen to be there, then that's convenient. Um, that's, so I, again, that's optional. So more, so the, but the pub night, so-called pub night uh, afterwards, so we actually schedule that after the dinner, uh, if people want to stay, they, you can just stay there for having a chats with the other graduate students because we were hoping that other graduate students would come down to that place and then have uh, join lively discussions about physics and life in Toronto. However, that's canceled. So there might be still some people hanging around and having uh, some chats, but uh, uh, that's not going to happen. Again, so all these things are happening uh, because of uh, the concerns about coronavirus. And tomorrow's uh, event is uh, at the moment still happening. So what was the tomorrow? Yeah, so tomorrow the plan is the, uh, the graduate student life presentations will happen. Uh, uh, I think that's going to happen in the graduate lounge. So the details will be found in your, your agenda. Um, so that's going to happen, the tours of campus, uh, Again, that's uh, something that's optional because that's the last thing in, in the event. So, uh, so, so that that will uh, happen organically tomorrow. All right. So, um, so that's the first outright thing that I want to say right now. Or oh, one thing that uh, uh, Krishna mentioned to me uh, to uh, re remind you is that uh, if you have coats that you want to store somewhere while you are. Uh, moving around in this department for the, throughout the day, we will actually have a, a locked room available so that you can actually put all your stuff there and then you can uh, move freely uh, in the department. Uh, it's not actually not that bad, so that's, uh, I'm not sure if how many of you actually brought uh, the codes. Anyway, so that's going to happen, and, but the problem is that once it's locked, it's probably not going to be accessed 
un until uh, you have to, uh, your, your plan to actually go outside uh, at the dinner time because lunch will be in this building. Okay, so that's uh, something to keep in mind. All right, so with that said, let's go back to start of the presentation. So thank you all for coming here. So my name is Young Jun Kim and you probably have seen my name on the offer letters. So I'm that person who signed you the offer letters. And I'm Associate Chair for Graduate Studies, and uh, uh, I am the person who basically looked through all these admissions uh, uh, process, and then uh, all of you are uh, uh, like highly qualified to take on graduate studies in, in this department, and we highly uh, uh, sort of anticipate and then expect you to come and join us for, uh, for our graduate program. Okay, so um, the outline of the, this, this presentation that I'm going to give you, it's uh, about 30 minutes, I'll try to be brief. Uh, are so, so logistics of the visit, I already uh, talked about that, then I'll sort of go through some of the, the introduction about the University of Toronto, Department of Physics, and then uh, that's, I, I'm probably going to go through that quickly because that's something, the information you can find on the web. Um, the degree program and the choosing supervisor, these are probably more important uh, things that we can cover a little bit uh, in depth. And then I'll try to leave some time for you to ask questions. All right. Um, so, uh, okay, so you signed up for the tours already, and uh, by the way, that's not binding. If you are having, this, are having a, a great discussion with someone, and then if you miss this uh, a tour, that's going to be fine, right? So you basically want to have a discussion. We'll talk to as many people as possible today, and then trying to get the best picture of this department to, to aid your decision about where to end up uh, in your graduate school. Okay, so there's a sign-up sheet that you already uh, signed up, and then uh, after lunch, lab tour will, so I told you that the, the lunch will be box lunch, you will spread over, all over to have lunch, but uh, after lunch, you should come back to where you picked up your box lunch, and that's where the lab tour will begin. So that's uh, something to keep in mind, and the lab tour, uh, if you uh, signed up for the one o'clock lab tour, that will start at one o'clock uh, sharp, so uh, please come back to this. Uh, so one thing that uh, changed from the original plan was the experimental condensed matter uh, tour used to be here spanning all over these things, but uh, actually, so for various reasons, the, there will be only two labs available for a tour for experimental condensed matter, so that we actually uh, sort of made it smaller, so actually it fits into this slot and this slot. So for example, if you are interested in theoretical and experimental condensed matter, then you can actually go to both theory and experimental uh, presentations. All right, so. That's that. Okay, so this is something uh, I a flash as a, I mean, you, many of you probably know, it's a, a Canada's largest uh, university with a lot of uh, uh, students, and then it's uh, consistently ranked number one, so actually uh, that's uh, something uh, the U of T uh, always are, uh, are it is proud of actually in these things. So, and then every time I think it's uh, somewhere there, right? So you, you're on the, Physicist, you know that there is an error bar and all these things, and that so I think the wide range of these rankings probably have something in common, and that you can sort of say that uh, yeah, so it's a, it's a good good department and good university. Okay, uh, Department of Physics is founded in, in, in 1997, and then the first PhD was awarded in 1900. It's actually more than 120 years, or almost 120 years ago, and John McLennan and. That name, if you're familiar with, uh, then that's actually the building is named, named after him. And he uh, only took uh, three years to get the PhD, which uh, is not impossible, but I have never seen in any time, any, any recent years, and for, for various reasons. Um, so uh, since then, we have graduate of uh, uh, 1,100 PhDs. Uh, it's a big, big place. I mean, that's one thing that I, you can take away from uh, this visit is U of T physics department is a really big place. Uh, it's uh, definitely the biggest uh, physics department in Canada, and, and on par with some of the biggest you know, the, the physics department in, in, the, in, the, in the U.S. or uh, all over the world, actually. So we have about 50 faculty members and 200 grad students, and then, uh, uh, so this is actually, you will actually appreciate and when you actually become a grad student is that we have a large number of support staff, which is not uh, very common, uh, commonly found in other, other departments or, or other universities. So that actually helps your life uh, uh, a lot, actually. Um, <clears throat> the structure of the department is the graduate department of physics spread over three U of the campuses. 
And we actually have a, a so-called tri-camper system, the St. George and Mississauga and Scarborough. Physics department activities are uh, uh, mostly focused on St. George and some in Mississauga. Mississauga is uh, very specialized in biophysics. And for some of you who are interested in biophysics who came yesterday, uh, probably have already visited Mississauga. Um, the graduate office is, is where I, I am, and then you have been communicating with the Krishna field for, uh, I guess, uh, for various uh, aspects. And if you have any questions about the missions and the funding packages or, uh, or many, many other different things, you can just send an email to uh, Krishna or, or myself, and then that's where you will get uh, most of the answers, or oh, mostly Krishna. She's been in, in this job for close to, I think, more than 15 years or so. She, she has seen everything, she knows everything. Okay, um, graduate studies at U of T, uh, the emphasis is on doctoral research. So uh, even if you are admitted to a master's, MSc uh, uh, admissions, we expect you, fully expect you to go on, go on to do a PhD. So, and then it's a research uh, program. So it's, a, it's not a course based, if master's degree is so uh, requirements, so even some, some options actually have a, a, a more course requirement than the other, but still we expect you to do a, mostly research. So it's a research-based degree, master's, PhD, and everything. And then we, we focus on research, that's everything. Okay, um, physics degree, so we, are, we have a one-year master's degree, and then uh, we have, uh, I mean, so this is uh, some, some details that you, we can actually go over once you actually decide to come here, but uh, it's, you can sort of think of master's as a one-year degree to basically explore what are the options. And then, if, and then so with, with the eye towards going, going to PhD, that's basically something that you can keep, uh, sort of think about uh, as a master's degree. And then it's not, so another way of saying this is not uh, a design to be the terminal degree. So uh, just getting master's is, is uh, probably not that useful in, in physics. Okay, so, um, so we have a PhD, we have a, a two basically uh, uh, schemes, and then most of you probably are here, uh, uh, accept, uh, are offered the offer of a direct entry PhD, so that's uh, sort of equivalent to a PhD program in, in the US, where you basically start PhD program right after bachelor's, or, or some, some people will go through master's degree. So, but uh, for first year students, uh, the, the life of master's students or direct entry is not that different. You're just uh, taking courses and doing, uh, the, doing sort of getting, getting your feet wet in research. Uh, main research areas in our department are, I mean, this, this division or so this uh, classification is a somewhat arbitrary, but uh, we have a, a sort of largely six areas, uh, experimental highness physics and biological physics, quantum optics, condensed matter physics, and Earth atmospheric and planetary physics, sometimes called the EAPP, and then theoretical high energy physics and, and cosmology. And cosmology is a strongly actually uh, sort of kind of uh, have a uh, connection with uh, CETA, the Canadian uh, Institute for uh, Theoretical Ast Astrophysics. Uh, breadth of physics research at Toronto is uh, truly unequal. So that's something that I always emphasize is that the, our department is, is big, but also it, it is a very, very broad. In, in research areas we have covered. So, uh, so because of that, the graduate program is deliberately structured to allow new students to find a new and uh, find the right research area. So, um, so that means, so you don't, so when, when you come uh, in, in, in the fall, so you're, you don't have to declare your uh, research supervisor right away. You can wait basically until the next January. So you are given basically a full term to explore what your interest is, and then take courses, and then maybe you'll find something new, and so on. Um, having said that, some students are very anxious, and then they want to get 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 determined on the supervisor right away. So, so that that happens. So, so you, there is a, a, a variety of stu students, I mean, who actually sort of decide on the supervisor during this visit. Two students who basically wait until uh, next January, and then uh, and then still actually, oh, I haven't decided. So, and then we have to actually track down them and then make sure that they actually have a supervisor by that time. Okay, so um, another thing that I also uh, want to mention for the uh, students that just studying now is that the boundaries of physics are, are fuzzy, I mean, to begin with, but it's changing all the time. So, um, for example, I mean, so, so like some, some people say that, oh, I like to do quantum physics. 
what does that mean? I mean, it's a, so everything is a quantum and, and physics. And, and then, uh, so that used to mean the quantum optics. And then there are some, some, some students actually, but uh, there is a quantum condensed matter. And then there is, a, of course, the, the high energy physics is always a, 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 it's a very quantum mechanical. Um, but uh, like some students are like to do, okay, so I want to do some kind of a computing related thing. And then I want to do quantum computing. But uh, oftentimes, uh, some of these computing uh, intensive thing can be found um, not only in the quantum optics, but uh, sometimes experimental high energy physics when you actually have to deal with a large set of sets of data, right? So then, the, so it's uh, it connects really uh, strongly with the data science and data management, machine learning, and that kind of stuff. So I think these things are uh, changing all the time. So it is actually uh, not enough to just uh, uh, to read from textbook or something like that. So you just, uh, it's very useful to talk to people who's actually uh, practicing physics these days and then see actually what's, what's going on in that field right now. Um, okay, so I, I mentioned that there are lots of actual institutes and, 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 and centers uh, associated with the physics department. Um, some statistics, uh, so I uh, said that uh, for the, we fully expect master's students to go on to do PhD, but some students don't. Uh, so, but uh, I, this is a number. So, about seventy percent of uh, master's students go on to do PhD here, and I, I'm sure that some students actually leave the program but go on to do a PhD in some other places. But so that means that uh, uh, most of the master's students actually go on to do PhD, and median time to PhD is about five point five years, and. Uh, this depends a lot on the research group. So this is something that you, if you care about that, then I think you should. Uh, you should ask your supervisors. And another thing to do is actually talk to other students. 85% um, of students who begin PhD finish it. That means our attrition rate is actually pretty low. So 10, 10 to 15%. So that includes this. So that's, uh, so uh, we, we try to, uh, offer to students who already are well qualified to finish PhD and then we expect them to sort of continue and then do the PhD. We encourage them to continue to do the PhD and then uh, if they have a difficulty we try to resolve it instead of kicking them out. Okay. Um, let's see. But sometimes it doesn't work, right? So sometimes you feel, okay, this is not for me, and then you just leave. And then these things actually happen relatively early in, in your career, so, so that actually you can uh, get your life back, rather than spending five years and then realizing or finding out that, oh, I'm not cut out for a PhD. Okay, so, uh, so right now, 25% of our, roughly 25% of our students are non-Canadian, so that's a, a little bit structural, but uh, so that's, that's the statistics. Physics PhD graduates from uh, 2009 to 2015. Uh, so we actually, the, the, the reason why we have this uh, statistics is because uh, University of Toronto actually put together a very large project to so-called the 10,000 PhD to actually track down all these PhD graduates and try to what, see what they are doing. And so that's why I think we have statistics for these uh, cohorts. And uh, among those, uh, 72 continued in academia and 24 in the government or industrial research, and then 36 in other areas. And you can sort of see that uh, roughly uh, two thirds or maybe actually 70 or 80 percent, 75% stay in, in the research and physics research, physics relevant things. And th you can actually dig into the data a little bit more. Uh, so by the way, this is available online. And if you are interested, then you can sort of go and find this more. So we have uh, uh, about 270 physics PhDs from 2000 to 2015. And then uh, so uh, the, the, this is basically the job uh, uh, they have right now. And then so tenure stream uh, faculty member is uh, about 40%. So that's, uh, and then uh, there are, are like po postdocs or research associates, and this, these are more recent graduates. So, so overall, you can sort of see that uh, more than 50, more, almost 60 or 70% end up in, in academia. Uh, things are changing though, right? So I, I've been in this job for now one and a half years, but a lot of students are now kind of more interested in uh, sort of a, a not pursuing academic career, but uh, sort of uh, getting a job in Toronto, which pays better and that kind of stuff. So this, this, uh, uh, so I think that picture is a changing somewhat, but uh, in the pri private sector, I think that's uh, again changing, but uh, what's interesting here, I think probably here is uh, this interesting. 
uh, the, the current employee list, the employer list is uh, other than you know, Toronto, the top ones are always like Royal Bank and uh, Scotia Bank and all TD Canada. And so, so you sort of get, give you some idea that where students end up if they don't continue in the academia. Right, um, and, and that's actually not a, a secret that uh, the, all these employers are actually highly uh, interested in hiring someone with the quantitative and analytic skills, which is definitely something that physics PhDs have. Uh, so that's actually why uh, a lot of these employers are interested in hiring physics PhDs. Okay, so having said that, the sort of kind of that gives you a background. So things that you have to think about at this point is, First thing is, is grad school for me? You might, I mean, I'm sure that you have thought about this, but maybe some of you actually haven't thought about it and just applied to grad school because that's what other people are doing. So, so you should actually, now is a time, before it's too late, to really think about, is grad school for me? Uh, and, and, and what grad school means is the five to seven year commitment with the financial support to lower than comparable salary for a physics uh, bachelor's degree. Uh, and, and that means you have to really love it. So um, I always sort of kind of to bring this up. So when you actually apply to university and then go to university from high school, right? So you do that without ever thinking about actually whether I should be doing this or, or, or I mean, I probably should be doing this because other students are doing this. Because I mean, most of people do that, right? So that's actually not uh, something you have to sort of think too, too much about. But going to grad school is very different. So there are two reasons why it's different. It, one is that uh, you are choosing to go to grad school because maybe physics is somewhat unusual, but uh, if you just uh, uh, talk to or sort of think about other students that you know, I mean, your friends, most of them don't go to grad school, right? So you're choosing to go to grad school and then going to, going to grad school usually means that you're sacrificing your uh, your salaries, right? So you're not going to be paid as much as your friends who's working in the Royal Bank. Okay, so that's one thing. You're choosing to do this. So you, so you take this as if you're taking a job. Okay, so, and then there is a, a lot of benefit of taking this low paying job, but so that's, that's something to think about, okay? Um, and, and, and the second thing is that the, the difference between the uh, high school and university is, is not as big as difference between university, the bachelor's sort of your undergraduate pro program, and grad school. Because grad school is not just to taking courses and then doing well in your classes. You are asked to do research. And then research is very different from taking courses and do well in, doing well in, in, in courses. So that's something to think about, right? So you might be an excellent student who's really good at taking courses and then doing problem sets and, and so on, and then take, uh, uh, writing exams and things, things like that, but maybe you actually don't like research. Right? So, and, and that's all your life, right? So for, for, as a grad school, for five years, you are asked to do research, and then it might drive you crazy. So something that to think about, right? So if you don't like doing research, research is a very, I mean, very vague. I mean, that's something that you should think about is that some students don't like like these sort of unstructured life of research that sometimes you are spending three months without really making any progress, right? So that can drive you crazy for some people. And then some people actually are, uh, so love, love that aspect that you don't have to have a deadline of some or you, you don't have to write exams and things like that. You basically can think about one problem for three months without making any progress and still get paid. <laughs> right, so, so that's something to think about. All right, um, financial support. As I said, uh, you're not going to get paid well, but we are trying to support as best as we can. So, uh, so you have already received an offer that if you remain in good academic standing, you, you will be uh, pro provided with a guaranteed minimum level of financial support, which is something like $24,000 plus tuition fees uh, for next year. And these things uh, creep up uh, every year. Um, of course, we would love, love to uh, increase by 20, 30% every year, but uh, that's not going to happen. But uh, 
we are, I mean, over the last uh, few years, every year, uh, definitely more than uh, uh, inflation uh, was increased, has been uh, uh, sort of implemented in this case. All right, so, but the, of course, uh, many of you who are domestic students can apply for an, uh, the, uh, the external scholarships such as ANSOC scholarships, and then these things actually can increase your earning potential quite a lot. All right, so um, what's that? The attractive feature of our financial support package is a relatively small number of TA hours. Uh, so this is when you compare to other Canadian universities, I think we looked at this and then we have, our package includes TA support, but that actually, the required number of hours that you have to do TA is very small compared to other universities. So, we, so that means our uh, finance package is quite attractive. Uh, of course, you can actually do more TA and then you can earn as much as you want. Actually, there are some students who are doing uh, several hundred hours of TA uh, work and then getting uh, very, uh, or living a very good life. <laughs> But of course, you are sacrificing the time that you should be spending doing research. <clears throat> so you might have a conflict with your research supervisor if you do that. Um, okay, so the TA is a good experience and an important part of the graduate training because some students really love the aspect that uh, you are not doing research 24-7. There are some uh, other things that you can do that kind of uh, uh, sort of uh, gives you some uh, break from research. Academic matters, MS can learn two ways and drag entry. So these things you can find in, in online. And I want to sort of skip ahead to go to courses and then, yeah, so these are all. Yeah, so this is, uh, I want to uh, make sure that we talk about this. All right, um, so I think it was uh, actually a few days ago, I found this on a blog post online. And this is a, a, a Tim uh, Detmers, uh, uh, apparently he's a grad student in computer science in the University of Washington, and he wrote this uh, blog post which is uh, uh, really long with a table of contents. And so I basically uh, read, uh, uh, read them. Obviously I'm interested in the, uh, the so, so the title is uh, how to pick your grad school, right? So, and then I'm supposed to give this, this presentation today. So obviously I'm interested in that. And I found it extremely interesting, actually. So I highly recommend you read this uh, blog post, which is long, and then maybe actually you can do it on, on your way home or something like that. Um, one, one, some of the things that I kind of really think that it's important to emphasize that one should not choose a school, but one should choose an advisor, right? So that's, that's how important it is. Because your graduate life, it's a choosing an advisor and choosing a research group is kind of like uh, choosing your family, right? So you were born to your family. You didn't have a choice, but now you have a choice. <laughs> so that's actually how you should approach this. Okay, so um, one, of, one of the most important decisions you will ever make in grad school is basically that. And uh, so think, to think about this research fit, advising style, and research group fit, and these things actually, uh, you can find a lot about talking to the supervisor as well as the current graduate students, and then they might uh, give you some insight. I mean, they will not actually uh, badmouth the supervisor, right? So, but uh, you can sort of uh, kind of read between the lines as how the life is in, in your research group. Um, you can decide after you get here. As I said, you, there are students who actually want to, I mean, came here to decide on the supervisor, but there are, it's a completely fine if you wait until uh, uh, January. Of course, I mean, there are some, some supervisors and some research groups which, which is a little bit more popular than other groups. And then that actually might make you a little bit more anxious. But some, some research groups actually do not decide on who they are going to take on as a graduate until very late. So, so that uh, is a very dependent on the research group. One thing that I want to sort of kind of uh, uh, say that's a plug for our department is that Another quote I, from this uh, blog post is that uh, one should choose an advisor, but you should be looking for advisors, not a single advisor. What that means is that you might be targeting one advisor, and then if you, so let's th say that there is a one department you really want to go to, and there is a super duper advisor that you want to work with. And you went there, what if you don't end up with that person, right? So that happens all the time. So that's why you should be looking for advisors. You should have a, your option B, C. So I think that that's why when you choose a school, 
the strength of option B and C is probably more important than your option A. That's something to think about. And having a big department has a very good advantage because there are lots of options. Right? Um, so this is the point. Note that you, we cannot guarantee that your first choice of a supervisor, even in this big department, there are some I mean, so it also depends on, right? So there's a really uh, uh, some big group, but the, uh, some, some people might actually have accepted already like three students last year, and then they may not be interested in uh, accepting new students this year, and that kind of stuff happens. So that's actually something to keep in mind. Uh, so we, we sort of uh, try to be, uh, uh, try to structure our program so that you can actually decide not uh, necessarily right now. Okay. Um, so that's basically uh, my presentation. Why come to Toronto? It's a great city, best university in Canada. But uh, the main point here is that the flexibility and diversity in choice of research area and supervisor, I think that is the, the most important strength that you should be considering when you choose grad school. Uh, and that actually brings U of T at the, at the top in that case. All right, I think that's, yeah, so that's my presentation. and. So now that I have said that there are so many interesting research going on, so we have uh, this uh, uh, representation from uh, graduate students who will be talking about their own research group uh, throughout this uh, presentation. So we'll have a break during uh, uh, this uh, very short break because I don't know how you can squeeze in one talk and then break in 25 minutes. Anyway, so uh, we'll go through that. So first is uh, uh, theoretical high energy physics chain. Does anybody know the shortcut for the? Full screen. Yeah, I can do full screen, but usually there's a presentation view, right? This one? Okay. Okay. All right, what are my buttons? All right, so let's see. Does this work? Nope. Oh, yeah, it doesn't work. So you always have to use uh, the Pointer, right. and then you can just. Uh, mm. Is it page down? Page up? No. Is there a better button? Eric? Your cursor is in the blinking one, so maybe if you click somewhere else first. Okay, at least. Well, I mean, that's fine. It's 10 minutes. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you can make do. Okay. Right. So, so uh, I was asked to make, remind you that you should be staying here because there's a recording uh, oh. at the near the podium. Yes. Right. So there's a mac microphone. Good. Here. Okay. Right. So if you want. To. Cool. All right. Great, right, everybody. How you guys doing? Cool. All right. So uh, I'm up first, and I'm going to tell you about theoretical high energy physics in 11 and a half minutes. I guess less than that. I'm a little behind. Um, so first of all. Theoretical obviously means pen and paper. We don't do experiments. We just inform them, or we like to think that we do. Uh, and high energy means that we deal primarily with short distance scales. So we do things like particle physics primarily, but not just that, as you'll, as you'll see. I'll give you a tour of what each member of the department does, and you'll see precisely where the limits and the boundaries are. Uh, so here's the department in one slide. So we have five faculty, two postdocs, and 11 students, myself being one of those. So we're a very small but diverse group. Um, our interests range from anywhere from phenomenology to string theory and everything in between. So no matter what your interests are, there's probably something for you in the THEP department if you're interested. Uh, so I'll, I'll go through, I'll, so here are the five profs on the, on the right, and I'll just go through them one by one in very little detail. Uh, so first off I have Professor David Curtin. This is my supervisor, I put him first because I know most about what we do. Um, I thought it'd be fun to phrase each of these professor slides 
in the context of what are the relevant research questions, what are, what are, the, what are the big open problems in the field. This works better for some slides and worse for others, uh, but for David, uh, two of the really important questions are, are what is dark matter, um, are there in fact dark, full dark sectors, not just one particle, but several dark particles, uh, and, and in particular David's concerned with what the experimentally detectable signatures of new physics models are. So David is what we call a phenomenologist, meaning that we are particularly concerned with what new theories um, can be detected, how can we detect them, how can we push the experimental frontier in line with theory. Uh, so David works on a variety of things, uh, among them are, are mirror stars, so if you have an entire dark sector you can have uh, dark stars being formed with all of this dark matter. Uh, other dark matter signatures is something I work on. David thinks about current and future collider signatures. Um, there's talk about a new muon collider in the future, so that's one of the things that he's thinking about. He does finite temperature effective field theories, uh, and one of his students is doing some machine learning with LHC data as well, so he does a wide variety of things. Uh, next up, we have Professor A.W. Peets, not a phenomenologist. A.W. does a lot of formal, uh, formal physics research, so A.W. is primarily concerned with quantum gravity in a word. So, so they think about things like what the microscopic structure of black holes are, um, what happens to quantum information inside of a black hole, what is quantum gravity, and, and, and people are quick to label AW as a string theorist, but they assure me that string theory is merely one tool that they use to think about quantum gravity. So the, the main thing they do is quantum gravity, and they use string theory and, and the ads CFT correspondence to, to probe these regimes. But primarily they're interested in what happens to gravity in really extreme environments. Cool, cool, cool. Okay, third on my list is Professor Bob Holdem. So Bob is interested, I guess, in gravity, mostly. So, so, so Bob wants to know how we can resolve the information paradox of black holes, and in particular what we can learn from LIGO data. So, so Bob is interested both in, in processing LIGO data and thinking theoretically about how we can go beyond Einstein's gravitational picture. Um, so a, two, two specific research directions that he has are, are things called gravitational wave echoes, which are, so forgive me, I, I literally just Wikipedia this yesterday because I had no idea what they are. Um, so gravitational wave echoes are apparently uh, something you can observe in LIGO data that should be signatures caused by Hawking radiation. Essentially when you have a black hole merger, there should be smaller repeating signatures of that black hole merger due to the presence of Hawking radiations. This is a prediction from Hawking radiation. It should be observable in LIGO data, so Bob is trying to extract that from the data. Uh, and he also works on things called not quite black holes, which are essentially um, a result of extensions to GR. So, so, for example, quadratic gravity will give you these things that look like black holes at lar uh, large distance scales, um, but they actually don't have horizons. They're just like classical ultra-dense objects that seem black hole-ish. Okay, two more. So we also have uh, Professor Michael Luke, who is mainly concerned with collider physics. So, in particular, the LHC is messy. Um, whenever you're colliding partons together, you have a whole mess of particles, necessarily, because of the way the QCD is. Uh, and so, so, Mike's job is to find a way to disentangle this phenomenon and actually extract the things that are useful. So he wants to, to disentangle long and short distance, long and short distance physics at colliders. Uh, so he has a whole, range of tools that he uses to do this. Uh, one major tool is called effective field theory. So if you, if you write down a quantum field theory, depending on the energy scale you're working at, there are certain parts of the theory that may be more or less important, and oftentimes you can make approximations that, that make your life easier. So when you're working in certain distance regimes or certain energy scales, when you're thinking about Q QCD, you can just factor out certain particles, and you, you, you write down an effective field theory to do that. So, so Mike uses this as well as a handful of other tools to think about LHC physics. Um, yeah, there they are. Okay, last but not least, we have Professor Eric Poppets, uh, who is closer to AW in terms of 
abstractness of field, if you like. So, so as you may know, most of what we do with quantum field theory is in the perturbative regime. So we write down a quantum field theory, and most of the calculations we can do rely on the fact that we can make it a, per a perturbative expansion in those quantum field theories. But obviously, there is a whole host of questions you can ask about things that happen in the non-perturbative regime. So Eric thinks deeply about these sorts of questions, and you need different tools to work with these sorts of theories. So, so Eric uses things like supersymmetric gauge theories, lattice field theory, something called anomaly matching, and of course, string theory as well, to try to think about what happens in quantum field theories in regimes of you know, strong coupling or that sort of thing. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that's all I have for the professors. There's not only so much I can say in you know, 90 seconds a piece. Um, just general department stuff. We have weekly seminars. We have a lot of overlap with other collaborations. Um, in particular, CETA is just three floors above the THEP floor. It's on the 14th floor. We have a, a, a three times weekly perimeter shuttle. So there's also overlap with perimeter. Uh, one of our postdocs in our group is actually joint with perimeter. So there's also overlap there. Uh, and as well, we have monthly tea happy hours, uh, which is a delightful name. It, it you know, stands for happy hour with the tea happy, with the tea happy department. Um, yes, yeah, so there's lots of fun things going on. Um, of course, I can only say so much in 11 minutes. So if you want more information, I'll be around for lunch, I'll be around for dinner. So find me there if you have more <laughs> questions. Are there any questions besides that? Anything quickly I can answer? Okay. Cool. Oh, oh, do you have a question quickly? Uh, I guess for doing theoretical high energy physics, what would you say would be like the max factor of need compared to like a normal physics program to get involved? I mean, it's, it's about the same. Typically, you want to be strong in, in things like group theory. Um, that's really it, honestly. Like, like group theory, linear algebra, it, it's, it's mostly basic stuff. If you, if you get into theor theoretical high energy, you kind of just learn what you need on the fly. It's not so important that you, you know, spend a year doing a math degree or something to, mm -hmm. to get prepared. Okay, so let's thank Shane again. Cool. And that's it. Okay, um, so try to stay here because there's a microphone. We are oh, recording. okay. How do I? You can. Oh, okay. All right, so hi everyone. Um, so my name is Nazim. I'm a PhD student here in Kinetic Matter Physics. So this is my fourth year in the department. And today I'll be telling you about all the cool things that people do in Kinetic Matter Physics, both in theory and in experimental Kinetic Matter Physics. So first of all, uh, the first question that I guess you're asking, if you don't already know, is what is condensed matter physics? And it turns out that it's the largest subdiscipline in physics, um, and it's the broadest in scope. It has significant overlap with many other areas of physics and science, things like quantum materials and nanotechnology, or um, you know, quantum information and quantum computing. I'll be giving some example of that, or high energy physics, which has been for a very long time a cousin of uh, condensed matter physics. So in order to describe this in very few words, uh, I guess all of you know that particle physics or high energy physics is the study of the very small and astrophysics is known to be the study of the very large. Um, condensed matter physics can be described as the study of the very many. So um, what I mean by that and is uh, like a famous quote by Phil Anderson from 1970s that the s'more is different idea where even though you can understand how particles interact between themselves, um, if you have a large number of particles, then suddenly they give you, they give rise to new levels of complexity where they act as if they were new particles that behave differently. 
Okay, so this is the idea of more having more and more particles gives you emergent new phenomena that act differently than what you would expect naively. So for a very long time, this was, uh, there was a, you know, a standard paradigm where people used broken symmetry or uh, the Landau, uh, Landau Ginzburg Wilson theory to classify phases of matter. So using this, uh, you know, this, this paradigm, we were able to distinguish phases of matter from using the symmetries that they break. And we do that, we quantify the symmetries that these phases break using what's called the local order parameter. So just to give you a few examples here, you can think of a solid as something that breaks the translational symmetry of a gas. So you will have, in that case, the order parameter being the density modulation um, in the solid that becomes non-zero, whereas in a gas it's uniform, right? So another common example is the ferromagnet, where in contrast to the paramagnet, where all these spins or you know, little compasses point in random directions, uh, the ferromagnet picks a given axis, and so you break the spin rotational invariance of the system, and you get a finite magnetization. So that is the order parameter in this case. And then there are other more, I guess, uh, exotic examples, like a pneumatic, which is something that breaks the rotational symmetry uh, in a lattice or a superfluid, superconductors, uh, which break gauge symmetry and give you order parameters like superfluid density or uh, gap order parameter. So this was very successful for a very long time until recently, a few years ago, people realized that actually not all phases of matter can be classified using their uh, broken symmetries. And this gave rise to this new idea of topology, which is coming from mathematics. And uh, this actually gave some people the Nobel Prize a few years ago. And the, the, the paradigm here is that uh, local order parameters are no longer good enough to describe these symmetry broken phases. And so what you need is to classify them rather on the global characteristics of the wave function. So the uh, conventional example that people give of topology is that of a donut where even though a donut has one hole, you can deform it as much as you want, it still has one hole. So it doesn't care about the details of you know, how large is this donut and so on, it only cares about the fact that it has one hole. And this similar things happen in kinetic matter physics with this global characteristics of the wave function. So a famous example in the context of kinetic matter physics is the so-called topological insulators, which are uh, symmetry protected phases. So what I mean by that is that if you look at this uh, spectrum here, so these are the energy levels that, let's say, carriers, charge carriers, or electrons can have in a given, uh, in a given material. Um, then if you're sitting at this uh, zero energy, so if your Fermi energy is here, then um, if this was an infinite uh, material, it would have zero states. So these two lines would not be here. But from the fact that you have a finite material, you can have states that appear, and that this gives you uh, basically edge states. So current can flow along the edges of this material, but it cannot in the bulk. Okay? So if this was infinite, you would have no... Uh, current, but for a finite thing, you would have current flowing along the edges. And this is a robust edge state, meaning that it doesn't really care about the little properties like the mass of the carriers or the hoppings and so on. It only cares about uh, the symmetry of the problem. Okay, so what does this allow us to do? Well, um, some interesting things uh, can, can, can be a consequence of this, which is that when you have this large number of particles interacting, usually you need to describe them using some low energy effective theory. And it turns out that when you write down those Lagrangians or Hamiltonian that describe the low energy effective theories, you can get terms in your uh, Lagrangian that act as if they were you know, these uh, exotic particles that particle physicists think about or um, have not discovered. Sometimes they have discovered, other times they have not. So examples of this are helical, the massless helical Dirac fermions, uh, Weyl fermions, Majorana fermions, which are fermions that are their own antiparticles, um, axion electrodynamics or emergent photons. And the beauty of this is that really you can test all of these things in the lab because given the fact that all these particles are interacting and, and uh, you know, interacting with each other, they give rise to signatures in the lab that you can probe through transport or spectroscopy and you would see what you would expect for a massless helical Dirac fermion, for example. 
So, uh, yeah, so other examples include anions, um, anions. so uh, from conventional three-dimensional uh, high-energy physics, we know that particles in three in the three-dimensional world can be either bosons or fermions. However, that's no longer the case in two dimensions. You can have things called anions. And the difference is that, um, so bosons we know can be thought of as things that when you exchange two of them, the wave function doesn't change, whereas for fermions, the wave function gets a minus sign. Anions actually get a general phase factor when you switch two of them. Okay, so you can think of this as e to the i theta, and for bosons, theta would be zero, whereas for fermions, it would be pi but you can have any continuous number for anions in two dimensions. Um, you can have things th that are even more exotic, like non-abelian anions, which are things that would not just pick up a phase factor, but a matrix structure would be needed to describe the statistics of the braiding between these anions. And these are important in the context of uh, fault-tolerant quantum computings, uh, quantum computing, so uh, people in uh, quantum computing and quantum information are interested by these things. Um, another uh, cool example is that, that there is a solvable uh, model of Majorana fermions that is actually dual to a black hole in ADS-2. So this gives people a platform to study uh, ADS-CFT correspondence. Okay, so what do we do uh, in, 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 you know, in real life? So um, I'm talking about both theory condensed matter and experimental condensed matter. So I'll start by what theorists usually use and what they do. And um, I would say that these can be divided into two categories. One is the analytical tools, uh, things like quantum field theory, renormalization group, uh, perturbation theory, and so on. But then very often one needs to use high performance computing in order to solve these large scale problems because you have large number of particles and you need to know what happens. Um, in that case, you can't solve it by hand, right? So you need numerical tools, things like exact analyzation, quantum Monte Carlo, and so on. Um, on the experimental side, um, people uh, do all sorts of experiments in order to either probe these phases that you know, theorists uh, come up with or um, characterize them or give ideas to theorists on how to uh, you know, write new models or uh, describe a given material that might be behaving some properties that we're not used to. So there is a lot of overlap or, you know, talking to each other between experimental and theoretical condensed matter physics, um, which is pretty nice. So examples of these experimental tools include STM, which is a way to you know, get atomic level precision images of materials, and rare reflection spectroscopy, where you can probe the phase of a superconducting gap, um, all sorts of spectroscopies where you can, so X-ray spectroscopies, for example, where you can use photons to map out the uh, electronic structure of materials. Uh, high pressure studies can be done in the context of superconductors, for example. Uh, then you need, there's crystal growth to grow the materials that people predict in theory or to give ideas, as I was saying. <laughs> Quantum oscillations in order to map out Fermi surfaces and all sorts of things. So there's a lot of uh, these experiments that are done here in the physics department. Others are done in collaboration with uh, national labs. Uh, in the US, and we'll be talking more about that later. So now, hopefully, I've given you a broad idea of condensed matter physics and what it is. Um, now I'll be talking about the faculty members that we have here in the department, and I'll give you very briefly a summary of the research that they are interested in. So if you want to you know, talk to them based on some uh, interests, you can do that. Okay? So there are four theorists. Uh, there is Arun Paramakanti, there is Hayong Ki, Young Bak Kim and Thomas Kafidi, who is the newest faculty to join uh, in condensed matter, uh, at least. So I'll start with um, Arun. So just here to give you uh, the information of the layout here. So I'm putting the office number, and uh, this is the email, of course, and the website. I'm putting them. Not all of them are up to date. So if you want some recent list of publications and so on, please check out Archive or Google Scholar. But nonetheless, the websites are here if you're interested. So Rune is interested in skirmion crystals. Those are uh, spin textures that can happen in real space. So uh, spins don't have to just be you know, pointing on the same direction. They can do funny things like these uh, skirmion, text skirmion textures. Uh, there's two-dimensional magnitude transport, superconductivity, and topological phases that I discussed earlier. 
Hyung Ki, she's interested in uh, spin liquids, including Kitav spin liquids, uh, frustrated magnetism, uh, topological phases, superconductivity, and electronic pneumatic phases as well. So I also discussed that earlier. Uh, Young Bak Kim uh, has similar interests. He also has been active in topological phases and spin liquids, but he's been studying multipolar ordering recently, quantum phase transitions, which are phase transitions that happen at zero temperature, um, and topological superconductors. So I discussed topological insulators earlier. There's also such a thing as topological superconductors. And finally, Thomas Kafidi um, has quite different interests, uh, things like uh, electron hydrodynamics, where uh, electrons, uh, the flow of the electrons does not behave like in an ohmic way like you, we are used to in a metal, but actually there is uh, viscous flow and things like that, just like you would ha have in a fluid. And that's a whole new field, well, I don't know if it's new, but it's a whole field by itself called electron hydrodynamics. He's also interested in quantum chaos, topological matter uh, is a big thing, as you can tell in the department, and superconductivity. So that's it for the theorists. Um, if you are interested by any of the things I described, um, I'm putting here lab in air quotes because there is no real lab. But we are meeting you guys um, on the tenth, on the fifth floor. Sorry, from 2:30 to 3:15. There's going to be, I don't know who's going to be there in total, but at least a few grad students, maybe postdocs, and some faculty members as well. We'll see. But um, yeah, if you have any questions about the day-to-day -day life and things like that. Uh, please drop by and we can have a discussion. So that was it for the theory part. Now I'm going to be moving on to the experimentalists. So um, it used to be that we had last year four experimentalists and three theorists. This time it's the other way around. I guess the theorists are taking over in a sense. But uh, nonetheless, there's uh, John Wei, there is uh, Yong Jung Kim, and uh, Stephen Julian. So uh, John Wei is interested in superconductors, um, specifically multiband superconductors. Those are superconductors that, for each band in the spectrum, can have different order parameters, um, or uh, that can be you know talking to each other, um, and iron-based superconductors, half metals, topological materials that includes both insulators and superconductors. Uh, complex oxide heterostructures and skirmions that I also mentioned earlier. Um, Yong Jun Kim um, is interested in uh, spin liquids, topological magnons, and topological superconductors. Uh, also, cuprate and iron based superconductors. So, the cuprates are these high TC superconductors, um, van der Waals materials, <coughs> and uh, thermoelectric 2D materials. So. Uh, many of the experiments that Young Jun does are performed in these two national labs uh, at Oak Ridge and Argonne. And finally, Stephen Julian is interested in uh, complexity in quantum matter, so that, in that includes quantum magnetism and high pressure studies of superconductivity, as well as uh, using quantum oscillations for studying correlated or interacted, interacting metals, and finally, magnetotransport. So, yeah, uh, this time there's actual lab tours and you have no reason to miss any of them because there are two. So you can either take the 1, the 1 p.m. lab tour which ends at 2.30 or the one at 2.30 and ends, ends at 4.00. Uh, and both of those will be departing from MP125. Thank you. Because there are only two labs, so oh. uh, it uh, became half of the length anyway. So oh. you have already seen this updated things. So next, we are going to uh, ask Aaron to talk about quantum optics. Great. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to U of C or Toronto. Um, my name is Aaron. I work in theoretical quantum optics. And I'll tell you some stuff about what each faculty member does and how they relate to each other. But before we start out, I thought it's important to just say that I never saw quantum optics in undergrad. And I don't think anyone here really does. Um, but quantum optics isn't that far out from basic quantum mechanics. And the one difference is that optics uses light 
and light doesn't have a mass, and the Schrodinger equation needs to worry about only massive particles. So quantum optics is like one step um, into high energy physics. What can you do if you add um, these photons into the picture to photons interacting with atoms and molecules? Specifically, now we have a lot of really good control over light by using lasers. And so we get to play around and say, what are the applications of having really good control of light for interacting with atoms, molecules, and making interesting applications? So to start out, I will do something. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I didn't know it. We can do. We can do the previous one. You found that. And now we click again. So the first professor I've got here is Professor Amar Guta. Um, Amar is an experimentalist working in um, quantum optics, and specifically what he's interested in very high precision measurements. And so one of the things you can do with quantum optics and um, using these really stable transitions between specific atomic sublevels is create really, really accurate frequency um, measurements. So you can get frequency standards of the order of 1 in 10 to the 17, 10 to the 18, and those are useful for then measuring other phenomena to very high precision. And then beyond that, Amar is interested in saying, if we have all this really good control over um, frequencies of our lasers, frequencies of transitions between atoms and molecules, can we probe things on really small scales where high energy physics comes into play? So instead of needing giant colliders for probing high energy phenomena, instead we can use essentially really, really, really good microscopes and focus in and be able to look for new phenomena such as um, proposed new particles or things like that. Specifically, um, Amar is working on an experiment using um, really good precision measurements of the electron dipole moment, but he's interested beyond that in all these precision measurements for where new physics could and is predicted to show up. Um, next up on the list is Professor John Seip. Um, John is a theorist who is interested in a number of things. One of the things he's interested in, we've got this optical response of materials, which is something like if you learned in regular um, electromagnetism that you have, you sh uh, say, shine light, send an electro electric field through a medium, you get this index of refraction, and that index of refraction is supposed to come out from the polarizability of the little dipoles inside of the medium, and they give you a new field, and it goes on, and you learn this, and it's great. But then he recently asked the question, well, if inside of a crystal electrons are delocalized, then what are these little dipoles that are contributing, that are giving you this index of refraction? So he's interested in these kinds of basic questions. Um, just one example of how does light and matter interact together. Um, and specifically with light matter interactions, you can get really nonlinear responses. So then he's also interested in quantum nonlinear optics and the applications of that in um, even as far as information processing a little bit. Um, next up we have Professor Joseph Tyweson. Um, Joseph is another experimentalist working mostly with ultra cold atoms. So to get very cold atoms, um, cold enough to make Bose-Einstein condensates, one of the major technological advances that enabled that was laser cooling, so these precision. So having atomic structure that allows for specific, you'll learn it, um, lasers that can help cool it down. Um, and then with these things, you get really good control over the um, quantum properties of these molecules all behaving kind of in concert together to give you interesting phenomena. And Joseph is interested in using these to simulate things like condensed matter systems, to simulate things like um, cluster states for quantum computing. Um, that hasn't been done yet, but, but they're working on proposals towards doing that. And, and using these really good control of their systems as a way of um, probing exotic or building or simulating exotic materials. Um, next up, we have another experimentalist, Professor Ephraim Steinberg. Um, Ephraim's group is interested 
they say they have about five different projects going on, interested more in how to experimentally probe foundational quantum mechanics. So if you've heard of things like um, Bell's inequalities, those kinds of things, it would be similar levels of, of trying to understand what really happens in quantum mechanical systems. So if you learn about quantum tunneling, what really happens when an electron is tunneling through a barrier? Um, what really happens when two photons pass by each other and don't interfere? Is there a way of you know, having two beams of light, like two flashlights cross over each other and somehow feel that the other flashlight was there and interact with each other. Um, things like, can you beat the Heisenberg limit for measuring two, um, two non-commuting observables at the same time? Things like that, lots of um, more foundational problems, but also with a few maybe ties to quantum information processing and those kinds of applications. Um, next up, we have Professor Dwayne Miller. Um, Dwayne is cross-appointed with chemistry, I believe, and is interested in the experimental side of things of what you can do with really, really good time resolution um, measurements due to ultra-fast lasers. And specifically, um, he's really proud of the fact that they took the first movie of an atomic movie of an atom um, because they could get such good resolution, but what he couldn't put on this slide, what we didn't get in time, was last year they were able to take pictures and watch some chemical reaction take place um, in the active site of a protein. Yeah, yeah, the active site of, of some, some protein, some enzyme, it's binding site. So being able to actually see how these processes happen and things open and close could be really important, not just for designing um, new drugs, but just understanding processes and understanding what um, literally anything at uh, molecular levels. Um, Professor Marjorie Banks, uh, Robin Marjorie Banks is another experimentalist. Instead of looking at ultra fast things, we're looking at ultra high power things. So he's interested more in what can you do with really, really, really strong lasers. Again, getting back to if you could make all your photons um, behave together, then they work together to give you really strong pulses. And that goes from um, just understanding nonlinear responses with such strong, yeah, sorry. It starts with fundamental nonlinear responses. And it gets to something like if I asked you what the most nonlinear response something could be, you might think a long time and say the thing that you're pushing on might break. So a linear response would say if I push, push on the table, the table moves a bit. If I push really hard, all of a sudden it'll break if I'm really strong. So if you use that with lasers, you can actually use lasers to cut things. And this nonlinear response is then something you can use in surgery. So we have laser eye surgery, but um, they're interested in things beyond that if you want to maybe, um, say, get your wisdom teeth out or something using lasers. That could be a few years down the line. Next up, Professor Daniel James. This is my advisor, so this is the group that I'm most familiar with. Um, we are interested in um, classical and quantum coherence. So that means things like quantum entanglement, what makes a system quantum, what are the actual differences between quantum and classical light or atomic systems, and how could you use those, how can you harness those um, novel effects to make novel applications. So instead of needing to build a large scale quantum computer, which we're still interested in, um, can you use them to build small scale near term devices such as more precise measurement sensors or more precise, um, uh, yeah, so measurement sensors is a big one right now. Um, and, then, and then we'll get into more of that. But specifically, we're interested in how you can generate entanglement, how you can uh, manipulate entanglement, and how you can then use that for um, interesting applications. Next up, we have Professor Hoi Kwong Lo. Um, Hoi Kwong is a theorist who does some experiments as well, sorry, um, who's cross-appointed with um, computer, no, electrochemical, ECE, electrochemical engineering. Um, Hoi Kwong is a, one of the pioneers of quantum cryptography, which is this idea that um, most cryptographic schemes um, are secure because they're hard to crack, whereas quantum uh, cryptography can guarantee or can promise that there are certain schemes that are impossible to crack based on the laws of nature. 
And so what they're working on is specifically things with measurement device independent quantum cryptography, how you can use these things, how you can um, distribute quantum keys, things like that. And they're working both on the theory and experimental sides, how to put those together um, for also really near term applications. And then the last professor we have on this list is Professor Sajeev John, who's another theorist in the group. And Sajeev works on, um, he's a pioneer in photonic crystal fibers, which are these ways of um, creating crystals for light, just like you could have crystals um, and condensed matter for electrons. And you can use these if you've seen things that are, um, no, I forgot the word, um, those butterflies, iridescent. Um, with those interesting wing colors, that would be like an example of things you could do with photonic crystals because what you can do is trap light and have light that bounces off at one angle, do something different depending on the angle that it bounces back at. And so you can use this for photon localization. You can use this for trying to create better solar cells and things like that. And all these applications basically about how you can create different crystals with different um, based on modulating indices of refraction to manipulate photonic properties. So just before I, I conclude, those were all the professors listed in the quantum optics group. There are also a bunch of professors, if you're interested in quantum information style things, who are um, cross-affiliated with either chemical physics, physical chemistry, or computer science, or things like that. We're looking, there's probably, I can't say anything, but maybe gonna be a new hire co-affiliated with computer science and physics in the next little while. There's people looking right now. So quantum information side is also there. Uh, we have a lab tour this afternoon that I won't be leading um, for the experimental groups, and I'll be around for questions for the rest of the day. Okay. Great, so that gives us 10 minutes to break. So, so we will have a, a break and then start with the experimental high energy physics at 10.45. So that's the time to have more coffee. A washroom is just across the hallway from this room. And you can just stretch overall. All right, so let's, uh, let's take a 10 minute break. I can just click on that. Eh? Right. So uh, what is experimental high energy physics? And I believe it can be summarized uh, with this sentence here is that we try to understand the universe at the smallest scales through measurements. And we get to ask very interesting qu questions such as, you know, what are the fundamental constituents of matter? What are the characteristics? And how do they interact? And um, the need, the, the answering these questions has driven us to build experiments and colliders that have uh, higher and higher energies, and um, yeah, hence the name high energy physics. But uh, to give a sense of the scales that we're talking about, um, I have you know some simple diagrams of the scales of various objects you might encounter in daily life, uh, such as the globe, or a scientist such as myself, or uh, an atom. But uh, as experimental high energy physicists, we're more concerned with the right side of the scales here. So we're interested in uh, particles that are, are subatomic. So the pride and joy of high energy physics is the standard model, um, which can be summarized by the table here, uh, which includes all of the known particles. Um, and this model has been driven by 100 years of experimental discovery, of which I'm sure many of you are familiar. Uh, and you know, arguably, it could have started with the discovery of electrons in 1897, uh, along with some very interesting discoveries, such as the discovery of antimatter in 1932 in bubble chambers, all the way until the most recent discovery, uh, maybe the, the Higgs boson of the Large Hadron Collider in 2012, uh, which U of T was involved with. Um, and of course, the standard model is not complete. There are a lot of very interesting questions left to answer. Um, like the standard model offers no explanation as to why the fundamental particles of the universe have very different masses. Uh, it does not explain the abundance of matter in the universe. It has no explanation for what dark matter might be. We, it offers no explanation for what dark matter might be, and perhaps the most shocking of all is that uh, gravity is not included in this model. So our group is uh, a set of nine professors, 
um, which are, are, are listed here. You can see their smiling faces. Um, <laughs> so most of our group so far focuses on the Atlas experiment, which is one of the experiments, the Large Hadron Collider. But you can also see that there are a few other experiments, such as Super CDMS. Um, yeah, and there's also five postdocs involved in our group and 21 graduate students currently, of which I am one. So uh, I mentioned the ATLAS experiment, and the ATLAS experiment is uh, one of the general purpose experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, which is located in Switzerland. And this collider collides beams of protons or heavy ions at very much near the speed of light. This is a huge apparatus. It's 27 kilometers in circumference, and you can see a picture of it right there. Our research group rents an apartment somewhere over here where I got to stay. Um, but the Atlas detector is right there. That's Geneva. It's a beautiful place. <laughs> but yeah, so that's, um, and to, this, this whole thing is built underground. So you can see a picture of it right here, where this is uh, where you know, the protons are accelerated. These are magnets that are supposed to um, have the protons travel the, the circumference of the Large Hadron Collider. I think you can use that. Oh, yeah. The pointer. Oh, OK. So uh, ATLAS is one of the general purpose detectors built at one of the interaction points at the Large Hadron Collider. It's a collaboration of over 3,000 people from around the world. Um, and this detector and the collaboration, along with CMS and that collaboration, discovered the Higgs boson in 2012. And uh, you can see maybe uh, a picture of the ATLAS detector here. And for scale, you can see two little people standing at just the edge of it over here. So this thing is huge. Um, and uh, to give a rough idea of how this thing works, you can see maybe like a cross-sectional image of the detector, where uh, the centermost point here is this point here. And there's many different detectors sort of layered on top of each other that are responsible for detecting different kinds of particles, such as a tracking detector, which uh, does not uh, stop part charge particles, but rather uh, measures their momentum through their curvature and magnetic fields. There are uh, electromagnetic detectors that are responsible for measuring the energies of electrons and photons. And there are also hadronic calorimeters in blue here that are responsible for the energy measurement of particles such as protons and neutrons. And then lastly, there are muon spectrometers, which are uh, responsible for the momentum measurement of, of muons, which might be produced in particle collisions. This detector uh, just finished collecting the largest data set to date, uh, which is very exciting. And there will be an even bigger one coming up. So the data taking will begin again in 2021. So it's a very good time to join. Um, our involvement in the ALICE experiment is very comprehensive. Um, so the Toronto group has been involved in the construction of, of one of the, the calorimeters uh, at the ALICE experiment called the, the forward calorimeter, which you can see Right here, this is built in the basement of the University of Toronto. Um, and we're also involved with uh, helping to run the ATLAS experiment. So as a grad student, you may, if you choose to, uh, sit in this control room and help run the experiment. There's lots of monitors to, to make sure that the various parts of the detector are functioning properly. Um, there's a smiling grad student standing next to the detector in the cavern. and. Uh, yeah, there's many different things that we're involved with. And uh, uh, later on, if you're willing to ask questions about it, I will be around at 1 PM, and I can talk about any of these. Um, so a new project that the group is very much involved with is, is the construction of what's called a new inner tracker. And this is um, a rare opportunity to you know, help build a particle detector, which will be put into the Atlas experiment in the future. Um, and this is a, a detector that uses silicon microchips to measure uh, the momentum of particles. Um, and yeah, it's, it's a rare opportunity to get involved with the construction of such a massive project. And uh, there's a lot of collaboration with industry. And graduate students are very much involved in the process. There's a few of them smiling right there where they're testing and building some of the silicon chips. Some of these I can show you on the eighth floor if you come up later today. Uh, and, of course, uh, the whole point of building this detector is to search for new physics. And uh, the, the University of Toronto group gives the, the students a lot of freedom in what they choose to research. This is a general purpose detector. It detects 
uh, it, it's built to, to, to have a, a wide physics regime. Uh, so analysis topics could include uh, Higgs physics, which is what I focus on, uh, and you can see a plot of the resonant peak from a, uh, what's the standard model Higgs boson shown here on the bottom left. So this is uh, uh, events where there were four leptons and a large uh, peak can be seen here, consistent with the, the standard model uh, Higgs boson. You can look for th particles that might exist beyond the standard model. Um, which is uh, one of these searches is, is shown in the plot here. And, and you know, of course, working on this detector is very exciting. There's a lot of uh, simulation software and data analysis and an event display of, of the detector's reconstruction of a particle collision can be shown on the right here. So this is an event display. Um, so another experiment that our group is very much involved in is super CDMS. And this is trying to detect dark matter particles di directly. And because the particle interactions with the detector might be so low as, as of, uh, you know, a few tens of electron volts, this detector must be placed very far underground in a mine shaft up at Snow Lab in Sudbury. And uh, I think this detector is very interesting because it uses a lot of um, uh, concepts from, from condensed matter physics. Um, there was a few interesting talks about this detector that I went to. Uh, but but if, you, if you're very interested this, in this detector, this experiment, I would suggest talking to, uh, to Miriam Diamond. Uh, so this experiment is not yet running. It's expected to start in uh, 2021. But there is a, um, a test facility that's now operational to support this development of this detector that is supposed to be very sensitive to uh, uh, what might be dark matter particles. Um, and this uh, is currently just focusing on data acquisition and analysis. And uh, if you are a grad student interested in working this, you might have trips to Stone Lab to help commission the equipment and, and take operation shifts of this detector. Right, so I think you have a general idea of what it might be like to, to work as a high energy physicist at U of T. So you can work in a lab, testing, building and helping construct uh, particle detectors such as the ITK, the inter new inner tracking detector, or you can work on analyzing data to search for new physics with the large data set that's been collected in uh, 2021 and of course the one that will be starting to be collected in, in, uh, in 2021. And then lots of us do both. Uh, many graduate students during their time here at U of T tend to do a fair bit of both and there's lots of uh, International collaboration, if, if you work in high-energy physics and Atlas, for example, you will probably get to go to CERN, or if you work on super CDMS, you will probably get to go to Sudbury. Um, and uh, there's also collaboration with Triumph, which is a facility in British Columbia and the University of British Columbia. And uh, there's also opportunities to be involved with an experiment called Dune with Nicolina in the near future, which I have not discussed here, but if you're interested in that, you can also get in touch with Nicolina. So, yeah, so uh, come by and talk to us. Um, so all of the professors are listed here. Um, all of them are willing to take students except for, I believe, John Martin, who's a professor emeritus, but I still have his office listed here. Uh, and yeah, here's a smiling face of the grad students, all the smiling faces of the grad students in the department from the last time we went skating. So uh, hopefully we can see you later today at 1 p.m. And thank you. Okay, so next uh, we have a biological physics, uh, Jeremy. Hi everyone, can everybody hear me well? Okay, so I'm really impressed by like my colleagues, their PowerPoints, like everything seemed in order, there was a theme. Maybe a lot like biophysics, my presentation has just a bit of everything in it, and it doesn't really, there's some universality which we don't really understand, very much like biophysics, so hopefully uh, nobody gets confused by it. Um, so what I'm going to do, I'm going to focus on in my presentation is going through each of the different labs we have, each of the different groups and what they do. Um, 
it feels like it would be, uh, you know, not very useful to just go over like what is biophysics and try to give you the best description of this possible since each of the groups we have here at the U of T really does do very different work with some overlap between groups. But just to give you an idea in general, biophysics is a lot about applying the knowledge or the techniques and methodologies that we've learned in, our, in physics in a more quantitative setting to bi biology and various fields which, generally speaking, have had more of a qualitative approach to their research. So in a lot, of the, a lot of the systems that we study are biology systems, but quite frankly, the work we do is very much similar to the work that you do in any other physics lab, okay? So what I'm going to do is go through the theoretical groups we have here, then the computational groups, and then finally go through the experimental groups, all right? Okay, so to start, we have the Professor uh, Sid Guayal group who work on collective dynamics of large populations of cells. So it's probably no surprise to the people here that um, in any biological system you have a lot of different interacting species and understanding how uh, one species interacts with the other is a lot about understanding the collective dynamics of the population together. So uh, in some of their work on coevolutionary dynamics of microbes, um, the Sid Guayal group look at how different uh, populations of competing species. So on one, set, on one side you have the bacteria who are trying to evolve to not uh, get decimated by populations of viruses. And on the other side you have the viruses that are trying to compete and catch up to the bacteria. Uh, you've got this constant like coevolution that happens and understanding how quickly one population uh, evolves compared to the other helps in trying to fight different, uh, you know, um, uh, epidemics that happen. So very topical, very topical today. Um, Sid Guile's group has both, it's, it's a bit, ex or most of the groups that do theory or that do experiments, you'll have a lot of the students working also on theory, but Sid Guile's group, which is mostly a theory, is one of, a group is one of the exceptional ones that has also a small lab running. So if you want to work on certain, um, uh, uh, if you want to work on experiments, it's also a possibility with Professor Guayal. And so uh, you have the uh, Chris Nunn here, uh, who works on this cellular aging and mitochondrial population genetics, which is essentially in bacteria, you have uh, mitochondria who have their own DNA, and within one, uh, uh, within one bacteria, you'll have m the mitochondrial DNA replicating multiple times. So within one system, which is replicating and, you know, uh, essentially evolving in time, you've got within it a system which is itself going through many iterations and understanding how uh, what's happening inside an individual propagates into the whole population. That's a lot of the work that, uh, that they do experimentally in the lab. All right, so the Professor Zilman, uh, Professor Anton Zilman group, which is my own group, is one that works on a lot of other theoretical models in, bio, uh, in biophysics. And again, a lot of our projects are very separate from each other, even within the group, so it's difficult to find an overarching theme. Uh, but it is a lot about just the statistical mechanics of things that happen within cells or even in, the, in populations. So uh, on the nucleus of cells, uh, are these nucleopores, these pores that form complexes which let things come in and out of the nucleus. So it allow for products of the DNA to come out and start being replicated within the cell's environment. And understanding the transport that happens at these pore complexes is something that's very interesting to a lot of biologists because you can essentially uh, start targeting certain viruses that do this, that send their own RNA into uh, the nucleus. So understanding the dynamics at this poor complex is something that we work on in the Zillman group. We also work on a variety of different um, uh, targeted de uh, delivery methods. Uh, so we have a lot of collaborations with uh, different uh, or engineering groups out at IBBME here at the University of Toronto. And finally, some of our other theoretical work concerns the evolution of populations. So certain populations uh, of, of multiple species interact in particular ways. And we ask questions about how, uh, how the populations are stable in certain regimes. So if you give them certain dynamics, how do the populations either go extinct or how do they interact with each other to create cycles or different stability points in the space? So you can see the t themes already changed here in the slides, but that's how it works. Okay, so another one of our more recent, uh, the more recent hires in the department is Andreas Hilfinger. So uh, Andreas Hilfinger works on understanding how 
in cells, you have a lot of different reactions that happen. And often it's, qu it's quite impossible to probe specific reactions. And all you can really get, all you can see, is the output, the product of multiple reactions happening. So uh, in biology, a lot of, you might have seen a lot of these really complicated schemes with all these different reactions happening. And it's really difficult to actually, un to actually know if this is what's going on in the cell. But if you claim, uh, uh, if you set some constraints, to what reaction or what the reactions might be, or how the reactions might be happening, you can actually make very uh, solid predictions on what sort of variance you'll see in the products. And this is the sort of variance and uh, that, that we'll, we will be able, that you can test for, that you can actually see experimentally. So um, just by making constraints on your reactions happening internally in sort of sort of a black box, you can learn a lot from the system. This is what they try to do, and uh, so. I promised also, I promised Andres since he's on my committee that I would tell you that they make the best espressos in the department, okay. Now to move on to our computational uh, biophysics group, it would be the Sarah Rosher lab. Um, for those of you that don't know, a lot of, bi a lot of biology, well, is proteins. Um, and proteins, often there's this paradigm in, in biology where proteins, their function is completely determined by their um, configuration. So uh, certain proteins that look alike will often have similar, uh, similar functions. However, in the last 20, 30 years, a lot of work has been put into understanding these intrinsically disordered proteins, which are essentially just these balls of proteins that move around and don't seem to have any particular structure. It seems to be important what the transitions are, how this thing sort of moves around in a very com complicated com conformational space. And so the Sarah Rosher lab, what they do are a lot of MD simulation, molecular dynamic simulations, in which you will uh, simulate a very complex coarse grain model of these, uh, of these uh, uh, proteins uh, over the course of just even a couple nanoseconds to try to understand how it might change conformation. Okay, and you can say after that, hopefully, we're trying to, uh, the field is trying to move towards a, another sort of uh, understanding of how these proteins who are who are part of like a group of proteins that do a lot in the cells, um, how these proteins and their conformational changes are important to the biology of the cell. So yeah, they use, as I said, uh, molecular dynamics. Uh, and they do also a lot of analysis of the different um, uh, experimental data that they get from collaborators. So moving into the more experimental groups here at the U of T, um, we have uh, the Grednaru lab, uh, Claudio, um, who do a lot a, a, of uh, microscopy and uh, spectroscopy. So it's a lot of uh, trying to, uh, well, that was too far. It's a lot of imaging different processes happening within the cell. And they do so by uh, labeling different molecules with different fluorescent proteins and seeing how these different uh, proteins interact. Uh, just by tracking the different, uh, the different uh, fluorescent proteins. Um, they are looking for a couple graduate students, so if anybody's interested, please contact uh, Claudio here through his email, or go to, I don't know when the labs are, I think it's a 1 p.m. You can go to any of their uh, uh, lab meetups. The Milstein Lab is also at UTM, and they work on uh, a variety of different uh, processes in bi biology, but it's a lot about understanding the mechanical uh, uh, properties of different things within the cells. So just to give you an idea, uh, here what they'll do is use optical tweezers, so light to capture a little bead and move it around in the cell to push against different materials, different membranes, and try to understand the interactions that happen within the cell that are difficult to even visualize. Um, another cool thing that they've started this year are uh, a, mother's, a mother machine. So I don't know if a lot of people know about this, but it's this uh, sort of these channels in which you have one bite of bacteria and you can track the lineages just by it splitting up and you'll see this nice line of bacteria that form and you can really see the history of the bacteria that forms there. So they've just started building one of those. Uh, I believe the uh, uh, Professor Robin Marger Banks was previously discussed, but one of the things that they, or some of the things they uh, work on have a lot of applications in biology, as was uh, previously described. Um, they use lasers to potentially make cuts into different uh, membranes or different biological tissues um, and try to understand how this can be used potentially in surgeries. Uh, it's interesting because the human body is formed of 
a variety of different tissues and they might interact differently corresponding to different like lasers you might use or different uh, intense uh, frequencies of light that you or that you use. The Barsda lab um, uses uh, nonlinear optics to probe again different tissues and different processes within uh, the uh, within the body. Um, one of the some of the uh, the things they're more uh, well known for is oh I forgot the word for it paranomic. Well, they use second and third harmonic generation, but one of the more recent ones that one of their students was, one of the, my colleagues was explaining to me was essentially using one imaging technique to try to image multiple or try to differentiate between different tissues within the body. Because one of the uh, compl uh, complications is a lot's going on, you have a lot of different tissues, and they, uh, you might want to, um, well, you definitely want to uh, do different things corresponding to what sort of environment you're in within the body. So understanding or being able to visualize that is quite important. Um, they've got a big group and I believe they are also looking for new graduate students. Again, go talk to them. Uh, it's coming up. And finally, uh, Professor Will, William Ryu uh, works a lot with C. elegans, which are these uh, microscopic worms. Uh, they're a model system for, uh, for a lot of studies in, bi in biology because they're very small, they, they have about maybe a thousand neurons, but they, uh, they still do very complex behaviors. They have very complex behaviors, so it's very interesting to be able to um, probe them and see what sort of behaviors they have corresponding to different things. So some of the things they do is they'll put them on a plate and start zapping them with lasers and see which direction they go. But it's, to, it's, it's essentially to test, yeah, it seems cruel, but uh, it's to test where, what sort of reactions and how the neurons potentially, um, uh, how you can construct very uh, uh, robust uh, neurological models from very small systems or ones that we can actually try to understand. And uh, this is an old slide. I asked recently in the lab, and the only one who's around still is uh, Colin. So it seems like there's room in the lab too there. Um, that's, I believe, hopefully I'm not, I think I went over a bit, but uh, that's it. Uh, I'll, be, I'll be talking uh, at 1 p.m. in MP505 to, uh, to anybody who's interested in any of the theoretical biophysics, and we'll have a couple of graduate students there. And then from 1 to 145 are also all the uh, uh, experimental groups uh, meet up. So go to any of those if you're interested. All right. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, so next we are going to uh, hear from Paul about the APP. Okay, so think back and forth. Yeah, I think once you do this, then you can do this. Yeah. Okay, okay uh, so I'm going to be talking to you guys quickly about the Earth Atmospheric and Planetary Physics Groups, EAPP. Also, I'm Paul Jeffrey. Nice to meet all of you. Okay, so what is EAPP? So it's an area of research focused on global scale physical processes in the Earth and planets. So including the Earth's interior, oceans, and atmospheres. And we combine fundamental physics research, so things like fluid dynamics, spectroscopy, numerical simulation, uh, with practical applications. So we do a variety of different things in EAPP. Realistically, I would need a much, much longer period of time to talk about everything. But broadly, the group carries out research in physics related to three main areas. So there's planetary fluid dynamics uh, and climate dynamics using theory and computation. Uh, we have experimental design and the implementation of global observational and remote sensing systems and analysis of observed, or observed global scale data, more or less modeling, experimental design and implementation, and data analysis. And broadly, we apply math, physics, and computing to study systems related to the Earth and other planets with a wide variety of applications. So including exoplanet identification, stratospheric ozone loss, uh, present and or past climate change. More or less just, if it's something to do with planets, we look at it. So, uh, going a bit more in depth into some of the areas of study we have, uh, the first one I'm going to take going to be talking about is uh, the atmosphere, ocean, and climate dynamics. So again, related to the modeling work I was mentioning. Uh, and really, we have two main areas. We have geophysical fluid dynamics, so the uh, modeling of turbulence, internal waves, uh, simplified models for implementation, and field measurements to cooperate with models. 
and we have climate modeling such as ice age simulations, climate change simulations, sea ice, and the hy or hydrological cycle. Uh, this is actually my main area of research, so atmosphere composition. Uh, we have, from the experimental side, space-based and balloon-borne remote sensing, instrument development, uh, satellite instrument validation, field campaign, and observatory measurements. And from the data assimilation and inverse modeling side, we have chemical data assimilation, inverse modeling of carbon fluxes, and the development of trace gas retrievals. So actually taking the uh, experimental methods used to uh, measure different uh, signifiers of atmosphere composition and actually getting usable data out of it. And the last area covered in EAPP is planetary and geophysics. So in, within geophysics, there's pattern formation, inverse modeling, mantle convection. Within planetary physics, we have things such as the structure and composition of exoplanet, planetary development, and planetary atmospheres. Now, there's quite a few of us, uh, well, quite a few professors in this uh, in the EAPP groups, so I'm not going to go into too much detail with all of them, but we have uh, Nico who does ocean modeling, Paul with, who does climate variability, Dylan who does atmospheric modeling, uh, Julian does terrestrial structure and dynamics, Chris Lee uh, looks at exoplanet atmospheres, uh, Bernd does uh, geophysical exploration, Kent Moore does climate dynamics, and uh, Dick Pelcher does climate dynamics and ocean turbulence. And because we can't fit everyone onto one slide, uh, Kim Strong does atmospheric remote sounding, uh, James Sue uh, does ocean modeling, Kaylee Walker, my supervisor, does uh, atmospheric remote sounding as well, Deborah Wunsch does carbon cycle analysis, and Kenya does seismology. Beyond just these uh, 13 faculty, we have two adjunct professors, five emeritus professors, seven research associates, 13 postdocs, and 31 grad students. We're a very large group. And I believe most of the people on these two slides are looking for uh, new graduate students. Some of them, such as James, is actually just uh, starting this year. I believe James is starting in June. So very much wants to just get a group going. So there's a lot of opportunity to work with us. Now, you might be sitting there wondering why study EAPP? Well, we have quite a few things going for us. We have a fantastic research infrastructure. There is the Pearl Lab in Eureka, Nunavut. Uh, about 4,000 kilometers north of us. Uh, we have basement spectroscopy labs here. There's the Toronto Atmospheric Observatory on top of the physics tower. Uh, we have a space instrument calibration facility in the basement. There's Cynet, a uh, the fastest supercomputer in Canada. Uh, we have seismology labs. The list goes on. We have frequent opportunities for collaboration, so work with the Canadian Space Agency. Uh, I was there actually just at the beginning of uh, February. Uh, we work with NASA. Who doesn't want to say that they work with NASA, right? Uh, Environment and Climate Change Canada and many other partners. Um, and we're, we're a strong community. Uh, we have many seminars and activities. Uh, we have the Brewer Wilson seminars on a weekly basis. And the Noble Lecture seminars and Center for Global Climate Change seminars are both bi-weekly. So we have a few things every week just to share our research. Beyond that, we have a lot of opportunities, such as uh, there's a collaborative specialization program with the School of the Environment that a lot of the EAPP graduate students enroll in. Uh, just gives you an extra bit of accreditation and extra chances for developing your professional uh, resume. Uh, we have opportunities for field work and collaborative visits to partner institutions. So uh, we do a lot of Arctic research, balloon campaigns, etc. Uh, the photo of the satellite dish up there, that's actually taken in Eureka, Nunavut. Uh, again, very north from here. Uh, actually, the, both of the top two photos are from there. We have a lot of interesting projects available. Uh, again, most of the professors are looking for people, so there's a lot of opportunity to get involved with us. And our uh, field leads to a variety of career paths, both research, government, academia, and finance are just a few of the things people have, who have recently graduated have gone into. Okay, now if you're wondering about studying with the AP, P, uh, the most important thing is that you have a strong background in math and physics. If you're here, then you're fine. Uh, typically, students take uh, courses in a wide array of areas, including broad courses covering things like fluid mechanics and data analysis, as well as more particular courses like data simulation and atmosphere chemistry. And many professors have multiple active research projects and are seeking students, as I said, so talk to them. Uh, yeah, and just a few of the odds and ends. Uh, one of the professors, Deborah Wunsch, has a uh, 
methane measuring instrument that over the past few summers, they've just had students, either undergrad or graduate students, just cycle it around the city to have uh, very detailed methane maps. Uh, we have basement spectroscopy. Uh, this right here is retrievals of water vapor from an instrument in the Arctic, so on and so forth. So, uh, more or less the message of this is join the EAPP group. Uh, for more information, uh, you can visit us on the 5th, 6th, and 7th floors while you're here. Uh, you can join us for the tours. We have one going on from 1 to 2.30, and another one from 2.30 to 4. Uh, you can email me. That's my email. I'll typically respond in about a day. And you can check out uh, the research website uh, with that link. I'll leave this slide up here just for a moment, so if anyone wants to take a photo of this, that's fine. Please go ahead. Um, and I do want to say, as a bit of a small plug, my supervisor is not here, but if anyone wants to potentially work with Kaylee Walker, uh, you can meet with me at some point today. Uh, she and I have discussed this. So yeah, there's that. My office is on the seventh floor. And here's just quickly the tour schedule. We're going to be uh, meeting up in the undergrad commons where we're going to be having lunch, and then we'll just have a virtual tour of the Pearl facility in Eureka, have a bit of a student question and answer session with a couple of the grad students, uh, we have an open path uh, instrument that we'll show you, uh, along with some balcony instruments. We'll quickly go through the Toronto Atmospheric Observatory. Then we'll show you the basement uh, instrument calibration facility and CALISET, one of the uh, newest instruments my supervisor has been working on. It's a balloon-borne uh, spectrometer. Okay, that's about everything. Great. Thank you, Paul. And the next we have Thomas for Astrophysics and Cosmology. Hi everyone, I'm Tom. I am a student here. I'm working in cosmology. Uh, if you are at all interested in astrophysics and cosmology, I would like to draw your attention to CETA, which is the Canadian Institute of Theoretical Astrophysics. It's located upstairs on the 13th and 14th floors, and it's really a central hub for astrophysics and cosmology in Canada. Uh, so some of the things to note, we have two seminars a week there, which means you're going to see a lot of visitors from both Canada and internationally. So you'll get a lot of time to interact with researchers in different areas within astrophysics and get broader perspectives on that. We have, depending on the year, between 15 and 20 grad or postdocs, which is a lot. And that's really a good resource that you can tap, especially when you're a young graduate student and professors are scary. Uh, additionally, we have different groups that have their own discussions with lunches. So we have a dynamics group, a cosmology group, rando astro for everything else. Uh, so there's a lot going on there. There are five professors at CETA who I'll go through, and then I'll go through some other professors who are also doing cosmology and astrophysics at U of D. So there's Wei Li Pen. He is a very interesting person with a lot of diverse interests. So one of the recent things is CHIME, which is the Canadian Hydrogen Intensity Mapping Experiment, which was originally just supposed to look for 21 centimeter lines, but it's also seeing a lot of fast radio bursts, which are kind of all the rage in the radio community right now because they're fast, they're radio, and we don't know what they are. Uh, he is unfortunately not around today, but definitely someone to keep in mind. There's Chris Thompson. He works broadly in what I would call extreme objects. Uh, so he was actually the guy who first theorized magnetars, which are a form of dead star that have uh, extremely high magnetic fields. And more recently, he's been working on some theories of what exactly fast radio bursts are and some novel things that you might do with dark matter. Uh, Dick Bond is my supervisor. This is his famous type of slide. Um, he will point out that CETA can also stand for Cosmic Information Theory and Analysis, which is a bit of a mantra of 
basically bringing the whole universe together and learning everything from everything. Uh, so he's really an expert in all things cosmology. Uh, he was really formational in, in the field of modern cosmology. Uh, he's been working on the Planck collaboration, which I'm sure many of you have heard about with the cosmic microwave background. He's also an expert in early universe physics, which is what I'm working on with him. He is another professor who unfortunately is not here today. He is down in the States, uh, but definitely worth a chat with. Peter Martin works largely on galactic dust. Uh, so dust doesn't sound all that glamorous at first, but there's actually a lot that you can do with dust because dust is going to trace the emissions of different star regions. Uh, it's going to follow magnetic fields. So there's tons and tons of stuff that you can learn just from looking at all of the particles that are not formed into stars. We have Professor Norm Murray who is expert on all things dynamic. Uh, so this is going to include things like galaxy formation, star formation, uh, planetary dynamics. Uh, the fire simulations are, I think, what this picture is for. This is just like a, a high resolution simulation of what's happening on galactic scales. So trying to understand all of the dynamics going on there goes a lot past Kepler's law, and there's a lot of interesting physics involved. Okay, so those were our five seat of professors. Uh, other professors here at U of T, we have Barth Netherfield, who is working in the balloon astronomy group, or alternatively, the observational cosmology group. This is really interesting. They put telescopes on balloons, they fly the balloons up into the upper atmosphere. They look at both uh, astrophysical sources in optical and UV, and also cosmological sources. Um, so they have, I think, two experiments they're working on right now, BIT and SPIDER, uh, which are looking at uh, both different things, but trying to see uh, what are called primordial B modes from inflation. I think that this is super cool because they actually see things um, sure. and they go outside and stuff, which not everyone does. Okay, so uh, more professors to be interested in. There's Keith Vanderlin, who's doing experimental cosmology. Uh, so you have uh, also radio and time variable sources like pulsars. I forgot to mention, but Wei Li at the start also works on pulsars. We have Neil Dalal, who is at Perimeter, but he spends his Fridays here in Toronto. Uh, he's working on basically cosmology, gravity, and large scale, so gravitational lensing, dark matter physics, large scale structure, and observational cosmology. Uh, he's a really interesting guy who's actively engaged in our cosmology launches uh, and always has a lot of interesting things to bring to front there. And lastly, we have Diana uh, Valencia, who is working on the interior structures of the planets. So the, all of these professors are expert in more things than will fit on just a slide. So my advice is talk to as many of them as you can. If you want to learn more, you can join us on the 14th floor at 3.15 today. There will be cake. <laughs> That's all.